Good afternoon, or maybe depending on where you're joining us from, good morning or good evening. Welcome to Open Classroom. I'm Janet Gillo, the Director of Professional Development for the Brown School here at Washington University in St. Louis. I'm delighted to be welcoming you to today's program. For those of you joining on the Zoom webinar, you probably know this by now, but we can't see or hear the audience and we can't call on raised hands, but chat feature is enabled and we'd love to have your questions and comments throughout the discussion. Uh, you're an important part of this program. I also wanna extend a special welcome to people that are joining on YouTube, either catching the live stream now or perhaps viewing this at a later time that's more convenient for you. We're delighted that you're taking advantage of the opportunity to participate, but wanna make you aware that we're not able to moderate Q&A through YouTube. So before we get started, I just wanna invite you to consider coming back tomorrow. Um, this week, like many weeks at Open Classroom, we have actually three programs going on and we're, we're back on tomorrow, that's February the 10th. We're gonna be joined by Shang Wee from Washington University's Olin School of Business. It's contributing to our Artificial Intelligence and the Social Sciences series with a talk that considers the question, does machine translation affect international trade? So one of the many things we have coming up and you are welcome for everything and anything, please do come back to us. Today, I'm joined by my colleague and friend, Laura Peer, the Associate Director of the International Center for Child Health and Development, who's gonna be moderating your Q&A. And it's my great pleasure to kick off today's program by inviting Washington University's Vice Provost for Interdisciplinary Initiatives, Mary McKay, to take over our proceedings. Mary. Thank you, Janet. Thank you to you and colleagues for all that you do to, to make our speakers and all the content accessible via, via Brown School Open Classroom. So thank you very much. Laura Proskovia, thank you also for playing an important part of our program today. So a couple of things that I, uh, before we get started, um, Janet mentioned that there are a number of programs on Open Classroom. Please do review those offerings and take advantage of these, um, you know, free opportunities to learn and grow in a number of different areas. One of the things that, that you will see some of us uh, on this uh, screen uh, back again is an event that takes place next week on February 16th. Um, I had the privilege of co-editing in a book with Dr. Ozge, who I see is one of the participants, Dr. Fred, who is the director of ICHAD, the International Center for Children's Health and Development here, um, as well as, as, as myself co-edited a book uh, that focused on children's behavioral health in Sub-Saharan Africa. So we are going to have a number of our chapter authors with us next week uh, at that open classroom uh, event. Jana put the information information in the chat for those of you that are on Zoom, but please check us out on February 16th. We'd love to have you at 10 a.m. Central Time um, join and hear from some of the authors of the chapters of the book. But now it is my deep um, pleasure to introduce you to our speaker, uh, introduce our speaker to all of you. So can I call you Dr. Amy? That's how we fondly referred to each other, uh, it, those of us that work on Sub-Saharan Africa uh, together. Um, Dr. Amy, you have come to us from University of California, San Francisco, from a Center for AIDS Prevention Studies that I've admired my whole career. Um, and so I'm just so pleased that you're going to share with us um, your intervention work that focuses on couples. Um, the couple of sentence uh, uh, description of your talk, leveraging the couple relationship to improve HIV treatment outcomes in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, the couple of sentences description I got made the really important point that if we are going to really think about meaningful HIV prevention, and in some of our studies, even, you know, care for HIV infection, we have to go beyond individual level interventions. And, and so, so your work is an example of, um, you know, really groundbreaking work that, that are really thinking about people in their ecology, in this case, in their, their intimate relationships. So we're thrilled to have you. Thanks for sharing um, your work with us. And please, uh, we're looking forward to both your presentation and then Laura will help you um, with the questions that we definitely want audience members to put in the chat so that we can have some discussion with the audience as well. So please, Dr. Amy, you're welcome. Please go ahead. Thank you so much, Dr. Mary. Let me um, share my slides real quick. Okay, I hope everybody can see that. So it's such an honor to be here today speaking to you all this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you're located. 
Um, today I'll be speaking about um, my work with heterosexual couples uh, living with HIV in Southern Africa, so Malawi and South Africa. And if you wouldn't mind just putting your questions in the chat, and I'll just move through the content, and then we can save the questions for um, a discussion at the end. Thank you. So what I'd like to talk about today is really, as Dr. Mary mentioned, um, the really the importance of looking at couple-based approaches and what they can really add to the science. I'll talk about the state of the science on couples in HIV, and then talk a little bit about some theoretical perspectives that we can um, bring to our research with couples. And then I'll talk about two specific projects in Malawi. The first is a dyadic investigation of relationship dynamics and HIV treatment outcomes. And the second is an economic and relationship strengthening intervention for alcohol users in Malawi. So before we get started, I just wanted to put up this quote from a seminal study conducted in 1988 by House, Landis, and Umbersom. And I'm sure most of you are working with, with social relationships, but it's always important to be reminded and go back to our roots about really the importance of studying families and social networks in just everyday relationships, because these are really key for our, our health. And so this quote here says that, social relationships or the lack thereof constitute a major risk factor for health, rivaling the effect of established risk factors such as cigarette smoking, blood pressure, blood lipids, obesity, and physical activity. And so can you imagine a world where we didn't study the effect of cigarette smoking on health such as lung cancer? So the same is true of social relationships. We cannot ignore them. They are a, such an essential part of health. So why should we study couples in health? Well, social relationships are medicine and one of the most important contributors to physical health and well-being. There was a study conducted in 2003 that found that married individuals had a lower risk for depression and mortality. And then it's not just about being married or partnered or in a relationship, but really the quality of that relationship that people are in. And so a really large meta-analytic review from 2014 found uh, that looked at 72,000 participants across 126 studies found that greater, greater relationship quality was associated with better health in terms of lower mortality and cardiovascular reactivity. So within the field of HIV, it's difficult to not think about primary partners as many of the behaviors that we, we examine directly involve or directly impact a partnership. And this is beyond the negotiation of safer sex. So I'll just give you a few examples coming more from the biomedical realm. So the first is PrEP, which is HIV, the HIV prevention pill, um, pre-exposure prophylaxis. And so decisions to take PrEP are really based upon you know, the nature of the sexual relationships that one is having, the, the state of those relationships, and whether partners are also living with HIV. The second example is long-acting um, injectables for ART or PrEP, which also have implications for primary partners. The third is enrolling in HIV cure research. So, Decisions to take um, to stop taking what is effective antiretroviral therapy and enroll in a cure study to test out whether a cure works or not is going to really need to involve the primary partners of that patient because the partner could be put at potential risk through their participation in the trial. The next example is prevention of mother to child child transmission, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. So obviously partners need to be involved in, in this process. And then finally, U equals U or HIV prevent, uh, treatment as prevention. And so many of the behavioral interventions for couples have been fairly efficacious at addressing HIV prevention, testing care and treatment. And there are additional benefits for involving the primary partners that go beyond just intervening with the patient. So primary partners can also experience benefits such as reduced risk for HIV, increased use of testing and better adherence to ART. 
So what are the ways in which we can think about intervening with couples? So according to the dyadic communal coping theory, better relationship quality leads to this process of communal coping around HIV or whatever the health issue is. So couples are really working collaboratively to solve their health problems together. And this in turn leads to more healthier behaviors, improved adherence, improved engagement in HIV care and treatment, and ultimately improved HIV treatments, clinical outcomes. So we can intervene in, in two ways. The first way is by really addressing the underlying relationship dynamics within the couples. So improving intimacy, unity, trust, the power dynamics, which will ultimately trickle down and improve the way couples cope together. Or we can just directly intervene on the more practical aspects of the relationship and directly intervene on the communal coping that's happening. So we can teach couples communication skills, forms of support, and how to more effectively collaborate around a health issue. So I want to highlight a second construct in the field of couples research, which is the idea of couple interdependence, where each partner's beliefs, attributes, and behaviors impact their own health outcomes as well as their partner's health outcomes. So if you consider a married couple, Tandizo and Chisomo, and this is actually, um, this example is coming from some of our qualitative work in Malawi. So Tandizo is, is living with HIV. He's the husband and he is you know, unemployed and struggles to find steady employment. And so his own poverty can affect his ability to take his medications through multiple different ways. But it doesn't end there. His, his poverty can infect his wife's adherence to ART through the food insecurity in the household and her inability to take her pills with food, through arguments over money and through other stressors that are associated with poverty. So for couples who are married or living together, um, like 80% of adults in Malawi and share a household, we really must consider the dyadic environment in which health is occurring. So there, I wanna talk about some of the domains and practical aspects of studying couples through various research projects that I'm working on, all of which really center on the couple level. And because I work in resource poor settings in Sub-Saharan Africa, it's impossible to really ignore some of the, the macro level factors that are going on at the structural level, such as food insecurity and household poverty. So I'm really interested in how these broader economic factors trickle down to impact how the couples work together around health. And so my work is focused in four different domains. The first is HIV testing and treatment. I started my career with a, an F31 fellowship um, way back in the day when testing was really, testing and condoms were only the, the main ways of preventing HIV um, because we didn't have the rollout of treatment as, uh, of ART at the time. And so that trajectory moved into studying ART as couples started getting on ART and looking at their engagement and care behaviors. The second domain is hazardous alcohol use. This work came from my initial investigation of treatment and testing, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. The third domain is cardiometabolic health. So now that people are living longer, healthier lives, they're faced with the rise of communicable diseases and diseases associated with aging. So we have a longitudinal cohort um, that's looking at couples living with HIV that also have e either hypertension or diabetes and following them over time to really understand what are the beliefs around multiple diseases, multi-morbidities, and how does that play into the way that couples work together around diet and exercise and different cardiovascular risk factors for, for, um, for cardiovascular disease. And then the fourth domain is mental health. So um, we are working on a grant proposal that's focused on perinatal depression and within couples in addressing depression at the couple level and ultimately trying to improve um, prevention of mother to child transmission. So many of us working in the field of HIV are often kind of driven by some of these broader global um, targets such as the UN AIDS 90-90-90 targets. And um, these data are from Malawi and actually Malawi is considered somewhat of a success story in terms of the, the targets. So 90% of people are aware of their HIV status. 
of the, I'm sorry, um, of those 88% are currently on ART, which is great. And then of those on ART, around 92% are virally suppressed. So virally suppressed means that they can't detect the virus, they're doing really well, they're highly adherent, and they basically cannot um, transmit the, the virus to anybody else. So these are really great numbers. Um, and so the questions that kind of remain are, who are the eight to 10% that are currently falling through the cracks and are really struggling with their, their adherence and their viral suppression? Who are they? Um, and then for those who are doing well in ART, how do we keep them well? How do we um, keep them healthy while they're facing the rise of non-communicable diseases such as hypertension? So the first study I'll talk about is the Amodzi and Banja project, which means unity in the family. This was a dyadic investigation of relationship dynamics and engagement in HIV care in Southern Malawi. And the goal was to really identify what are the key relationship dynamics? What are the elements of relationships that are really important for HIV treatment engagement? And how can we start to intervene on these dynamics with couples? Um, and so that th this was a mixed method study with a qualitative phase followed by a quantitative phase. And during the initial qu uh, qualitative phase, we started seeing alcohol use come up as a really important theme that we hadn't really thought about from the start. And around 30% of the couples were experiencing challenges with drinking. And so we were really curious about this and we sought additional funding to really dig deeper into a subset of alcohol users within the Emoji and Bandra project to really understand what are their patterns of use, how are couples supporting each other and what are some of the challenges with drinking. Before I go into the, the alcohol findings, I just wanna just point out that relationship dynamics do matter for, for adherence. And we've published several papers on this. The first paper um, really highlighted that infidelity and for lack of a better word, um, these are married couples. So marital infidelity combined with food insecurity really creates this pattern of instability within the couple and prevents them from really supporting each other effectively around antiretroviral therapy. Um, the second study we published was a quantitative in, um, investigation, really finding that bi-directional and intimate partner violence was associated with poor adherence to care and treatment, which is a, makes a novel contribution to the literature because often violence is really taken from the perspective of women as the victims. And we found that when couples have both partners are experiencing violence as, as victims, not just the women, they're um, more likely to be non-adherent than just if one partner was experiencing violence. And then the last study here was from South Africa where we really identified the different forms of support um, within couples on ART and, and, um, and how they, the relationship dynamics that were key for support. So switching gears back to the more interesting, I'd say, um, alcohol findings. So this was a paper that we published really highlighting that cup, um, alcohol use may be best understood as a couple level issue. And so we found that the, the husbands who are the primary alcohol drinkers in this setting, women, um, few women actually drink. So the husbands are the main drinkers. And we found that their alcohol use impacted their adherence to ART, um, which is no surprise. But we also found that the husband's alcohol use impacted the wife's adherence to ART, even though she was not a drinker. And this occurred through the intimate partner violence that was associated with the husband's alcohol use, as well as other things like food insecurity and just having a partner who was intoxicated and not available to provide that support for her. These are some of uh, the findings from our quantitative phase. And we found that drinkers, alcohol use was associated with a lower odds of adherence to ART. And then we also found that physical, sexual, and emotional IPV were associated with lower adherence to ART. So one way that alcohol use can impact adherence could be through the pathway of intimate partner violence. In our sub-study with alcohol drinkers, we published another paper really highlighting the multi-level determinants of alcohol use. And I'll just highlight a few themes for you. 
we found that men were really drinking to cope with poverty and feeling hopeless um, at the economic level. At the social and community level, we found that men were experiencing a lot of peer pressure from friends to drink and really just wanted the, um, the friendship, the male companionship associated with drinking together. And that was a barrier to stopping. And then at the dyadic level, we found that women were really struggling to effectively communicate around reducing alcohol use. And this could be due to some of the gender power dynamics within the household. They would talk about how their husband would temporarily stop, but then he would go back to his old patterns. And they felt like they just didn't have the skills to make much progress on his alcohol use. And, and while they were worried about the, the drinking, they were actually more concerned about the, the money that was being spent on the drinking and how that was taking away from precious resources at the household level, such as sending a child to school. So all of this culminated in the Malambe intervention, which kind of is a multi-level intervention that addresses both the economic and the relationship um, aspects of health. And so it takes a village to do these studies. So this is a collaboration between UCSF, um, WashU, University of Michigan, and Invest in Knowledge in Malawi. And the overarching goal of Malambe is to develop and pilot test an economic and relationship strengthening intervention to reduce alcohol use. And the premise is that we believe that if people can redirect the funds that they would spend on alcohol use into savings and into investing in some sort of you know, income generating activity, they will be able to both break the cycle of poverty and break the cycle of drinking that's keeping them in poverty. But we wanted to give them the skills to be able to do this. So we are engaging them, the couples together um, on alcohol use and finances with communication skills and financial literacy skills, which we believe will decrease alcohol use in, um, and IPV or intimate partner violence and improve adherence to ART. So the Malambi intervention consists of two main components. The economic strengthening activities is the first and this is all modeled after Dr. Fred's work um, with the SUBI intervention in Bridges in Uganda. And so couples get a joint savings account at a national bank, and then they save their money every month while they attend their monthly sessions over a 10 month period. And for each kwacha that they save, they're eligible for a match one-to-one -one, up to 10 US dollars per month. And so as part of these activities, they also get in-depth financial literacy education modeled after the SUBI sessions. So they get everything from, you know, how to set up a household budget, what's a necessary versus optional expense, what are some strategies for saving money, what are, you know, what are some options for getting loans, um, and how to use a bank. It's very comprehensive. And then they also get support at the end for starting an income generating activity of their choice. So it could be you know, starting a tomato business or buying livestock. Um, and so at the end, they, they take what they have saved and start to reinvest it in something for their family. And then we did this in a group format. So they're in cohorts together and they are able to get um, peer support related to savings and alcohol use. And so we coupled the, these activities with relationship strengthening activities. So couples get, they attend group sessions on relationship dynamics, you know, everything about telling your partner how, what you appreciate about them, really going back to their core relationship and why they got married and why they're together and what they love about each other. And then they learn um, really formal communication skills called the initiator receiver technique. Um, and then they get additional help with a, a counselor. So they work one-on-one -on -one with a counselor and practice their communication techniques in front of the counselor and work on setting goals around alcohol reduction. So this is our study design. So our first phase is, is formative. And so we're doing focus group discussions with key stakeholders to really get input on the combined intervention and get feedback and make sure that it's feasible and acceptable to people and to work out those details. And then our second phase was to really get the infrastructure in place, the materials, the manuals um, to really start the pilot phase. 
And then the third phase is to do a pilot randomized controlled tr trial with 80 couples to assess feasibility and acceptability of the intervention. And this is our pilot study design. So we recruit, we're calling them index patients from three different clinics in the Zomba district. And if the index patient is eligible, we screen their partner in a separate screening. And if their partner is eligible, then they become enrolled in the study and they do a baseline survey. And then they are randomized to either the intervention arm or in the control arm, which consists of an enhanced standard of care or brief 15 minute brief alcohol counseling session. And then we let them you know, save their money over 10 months, invest in their business. And then we assess them right after the intervention sessions are over. And then 15 months later, after they've had time to start their business and hopefully start to see some of the benefits of it. Um, I'll also just point out that we do exclude couples who experience severe intimate partner violence in the past three months or believe that they could be at risk for, um, for violence through participation in the study. Our main outcomes are really focused on feasibility and acceptability. So can we enroll the sample? Will they attend the sessions and participate? Can we retain them over time? Are they satisfied with the intervention? And then we're doing some exit interviews to kind of contextualize those, those data and really understand what people like and don't like. And then for the future trial, we're really gonna be focused on our primary outcome of number of drinking days in the past 30 confirmed with a PATH biomarker and a measure of adherence. And so we're collecting everything that we plan to collect in the future trial, just to you know, um, make sure that we can, you know, to pilot our instruments and refine them. Um, but we're really not powered to assess our, you know, clinical outcomes at this point. Our main focus is on feasibility and acceptability. So we, with our, um, our key stakeholder findings, so we did focus groups with HIV care providers, microfinance and bank representatives, um, alcohol vendors, couples and uh, local the village authority and religious authorities. And overall people were very, had a lot of many positive to, things to say about the intervention. And so they really liked the, the couple-based approach that we were taking and felt that by engaging both of them together that the both partners would be able to kind of reinforce the material because they both learn it. And they really liked the, the fact that women are often in charge of some of the finances in rural parts of, of Sub-Saharan Africa. And so engaging the men could be really beneficial in terms of you know, leading to less conflict around money and arguments because they're, they're both engaged together in making financial decisions. So they really liked that. Um, some concerns that were raised, these are just a few of the things that came out. So in this setting, there's very high divorce rates. And so participants were concerned that what if they save all the money and then one partner withdraws the money and leaves. And so what we did to address that concern was at the first session, they, they do a couple financial agreement. So they sit down together and they discuss who can make withdrawals, who can make deposits, is it both of them, is it just one? Um, and they work out the details of that. You know, what types of things do they need permission from their partner to do with regard to withdrawals? And then they, they sign it and they're allowed to change their agreement as the intervention unfolds, because maybe it turns out like the, the husband doesn't want to have that responsibility and they can, they can change it. So it's, it's very flexible. But we, rather than restrict them and say, you, can, you both have to be present to make withdrawals, we really wanted to empower them and give them the skills to be able to make these decisions together. The second concern was around confidentiality. And it wasn't just about HIV, which is obviously very private in this setting, but also about money. So money is very sensitive as well. And when people start talking in the villages about this, this family has so much money, they could actually put themselves at risk. And so they were very concerned about that. And so at the start of the intervention, we have this really in-depth confidentiality pledge where they, they, we posted on a flip chart and we posted every session. So they are reminded of the confidentiality pledge and they come up and, and sign it. The third concern was around transport expenses to the banks. So 
some of our participants, many of them are actually living in very rural areas where it's difficult to get to the towns to do the banking because of transport expenses. And so what we did was we involved um, village banking agents who are based in the rural areas and they, they work for the banks. So they're employed by the banks and the couples can go and talk to them and then they can do their banking through the, the village banking agent. And so initially some of our couples were very hesitant to work with a stranger and, and give them their money. So we really had to work to build trust with those village banking agents um, and let them know, you know, don't give them your pin to your bank account, you enter it in yourself. And so there was some training involved to really be, for them to be able to, to do that in a way that they felt comfortable. The fourth um, concern was around mobile money. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the banking is done through mobile phones and airtime. And people thought that was very important for, you know, for folks to know how to, to do the mobile money as an option. And we obviously are going through Dr. Fred's um, banking strategy and in, in not going through mobile money, but we did decide to involve mo mobile money providers in the sessions just as a way to provide more education for folks and to give them, you know, this is an additional tool that you can, you can use if you want to. And we've, we really have them explain all the fees associated with mobile money um, banking. And then the final concern was around food insecurity. And so, you know, this population is, is highly food insecure. And so at each group session, we provide a really full, healthy, nutritious meal. And then while they have their lunch, they work on kind of a group activity related to the topic of the intervention for that day. And so they can kind of learn from each other about what works um, uh, related to banking or savings or whatever the topic is. So as most researchers working during the COVID area in Sub-Saharan Africa, we've experienced, you know, we, we started this in 2020 and we had hoped to get to Malawi to be able to train staff. And we kept waiting and waiting, hoping that COVID would just go away. And of course it never did. And so we had to switch our entire plan to a remote training format. And this is difficult in a place like Malawi where internet connectivity is not ideal. And so we developed this really intensive curriculum where each day while, while we're sleeping, they have readings and videos and practical exercises that the team works on. And then when we get up, we have a phone call with them to really answer questions that they had regarding that day's um, training activities. And this, this went on for about six weeks or so. So it was a success, but it was a lot of work to make all the videos and to get everything prepared for the team. Um, this is a rural population. And so our staff um, who, who don't have phones. And so one of the challenges has been really tracking couples at their home villages and, and following up with them when they don't have phones. And these, these um, couples live in very um, geographically, uh, you know, distances far away from each other. So it, it's a lot of time spent in cars, going to various villages and, and asking around for a certain couple to really make contact with them. We give out phones once they're enrolled um, because a lot of the couples don't have a cell phone, but of course there's still challenges with phones that they're not charged, they're out of network. And then of course, um, recruiting during multiple waves, waves of the um, pandemic was a challenge because participants just weren't coming to the clinics for their ARVs. And then we had to figure out how to protect our staff and participants um, while recruiting in very busy healthcare centers. And then finally, um, the vaccine hesitancy issues. So the vaccine uptake is, is very low in Malawi. I think it's still hovering around 5% or so. And um, luckily now 80% of Malawians have a natural immunity to um, some form of, of the coronavirus, um, and this was pre-Omicron, so um, that's natural immunity is going to be probably the way forward, um, but it was a challenge to try to get people vaccinated so we could protect everybody. 
And despite all of these challenges, we, um, we've made some really great progress. So we, in, we screened 89 couples, um, fully screened means both partners were screened and, and of those, all of them were eligible for our study. Of those that were eligible, we administered baseline surveys to 94% of them. And then of those who were baselined, we enrolled 88% into the trial. And so we have 39 couples in the intervention and 39 couples in the control arm. We, we did our recruitment using a block recruitment strategy. So we would work at each of three clinics until we enrolled our block of 20. And then we would do our randomization ceremony. So each of the blocks are pretty homogeneous in terms of they, they come from the same clinic with the exception of block three, which is a mix of blocks, a mix of participants across the three different uh, clinical sites. This is a picture of the a randomization ceremony that I had the pleasure to attend in November when I was in Malawi. And it was just so wonderful to see all of our hard work come to fruition and, and see these couples together sitting next to each other. Um, after all the work it took to enroll a block. And so the couples would, they would come to the ceremony, they would get a number when they came, um, and then the, they would call their number and they would come up and pull an envelope out of a box that had been randomly assigned to either intervention or control. And then the couples who are assigned to the control, they immediately get 15 minutes of brief alcohol counseling following the ceremony. And then the intervention couples go about their way until the first um, session. So our attendance rates are really, really amazing thus far. Um, so the first block of couples, um, so they're the furthest along in the intervention because they've, they've completed sessions one through seven thus far out of 10. And we have essentially 100% attendance rates across most of the blocks. And there's just been one couple for the last more recent block that missed due to uh, the husband traveling for work. So people are showing up. Um, it's even rainy season right now, which is another challenge. Um, so we're really excited about um, these attendance rates. And anecdotally, when I was there in Malawi, I was able to talk with some of the couples and they just expressed you know, so much gratitude for being in the study and really felt like it was really improving their, their families. So um, this is all really promising news. We asked them about their satisfaction levels with the intervention and 100% of couples are satisfied or very satisfied and all would recommend it to a friend, which is really, um, really great to hear. The baseline characteristics of the, the sample. So the mean age is around 43, 70% have a primary school education or less, and 57% reported severe food insecurity. So most of them, 87%, have some level of, of food insecurity. So this is a highly food insecure population. The couples had been together for about almost 14 years on average and 84% of them were seroconcordant positive, which means that both partners are living with HIV. Um, there's moderate levels of physical and sexual violence, which are consistent with our prior work, and 67% reported 95% adherence or higher, which is actually much lower than in the Emozi and Banja project, which was a more general population of couples. So, these are alcohol drinkers. They are, you know, they're struggling more with their alcohol use than other types of couples. This is um, a visual of the types of alcohol that people are drinking, which I thought was interesting. So 60 of those who drink, 63% are drinking cachasu, which is a locally made spirit and it's made in the in the villages and it's it's the alcohol content is is very high so it could be about 70 percent alcohol and there's rumors that it can also contain ethanol so it's a really not a, a great drink um, and people will drink a whole 750 50 milliliter bottle of kachasu in a day so um the next common drinks are chikungunyeni, which is the local beer that people make in the villages. 
and they usually sit around a common pot and pass around a cup. Um, chibuku is the next common, which is fermented sorghum beer. And then fewer people are drinking commercially available spirits and, and beer, um, mostly because it's just more expensive than some of the more locally made um, alcohol. So this is our alcohol use at baseline based on the audit C. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the husbands are the primary drinkers. So 92% of the women don't drink any alcohol. Um, there's a few women who drink and 94% of the men are the heavy drinkers in the couple. We use the timeline follow back to assess past 30 day drinking, which is kind of the gold standard for self-reported alcohol use. And we found that the mean number of drinking days in the past 30 was around 6.5. The mean number of drinks in the past 30 was around 60. And then the average number of drinks per day is around eight. So when people are drinking, they are drinking a lot. And this data is hot off the press. So we're really gonna start um, looking more closely at the different patterns of drinking. Are people drinking on the weekends? Are they drinking you know, at the end of the month? And, and really trying to like understand more about what's going on. So are couples able to save? So of the 39 couples that were uh, randomized to the intervention, 33 of them have made deposits in their bank accounts. So I just wanna point out that when we started the intervention, none of the couples, maybe a few, maybe one or two, had ever used a bank account, ever. <laughs> and so some of them didn't even have um, identification to be able to get a bank account. So on day one, our facilitators had to work really hard to get people set up with their national IDs and get them registered to, to get a bank account. So it's quite amazing that they, they're using them after having no experience with them. Um, five couples have not made deposits, but these couples have only done one or two sessions. And so they're newer to the intervention and, and they just haven't had the time to, to save yet. So block one is the couples that are the furthest along and they've completed seven out of 10 sessions. So they have been able to save for seven months now. And the last month they saved on average around 5,400 kwacha, which is the equivalent of seven US dollars. Um, and some had saved up to 10 US dollars. So it doesn't seem like much, but this is a, a setting where, you know, average monthly incomes could be around 40 US dollars. So I am really, really happy with the savings that people are, are um, able to make. The cumulative mean savings for this block one over the past seven months. So they've saved on average around 80 US dollars over seven months with some even saving up to 120 US dollars. So it's really remarkable. So the next steps are to finish up our intervention sessions. Couples are starting to think about what they're going to invest their money into. And then we're gonna connect them with extension workers in the community to buy cows or buy fertilizer for a tomato business or whatever their business of choice is. And then we'll be starting the 10 month follow-up with block one in April or May. And we'll be doing blood draws for viral load as well as PATH, which is an alcohol biomarker. And we'll be starting exit interviews, which I think are gonna be really informative to really understand what couples liked and disliked about the intervention so that we can tweak it for the next um, grant. And then we'll follow up at 15 months um, starting in September. And hopefully all of this will culminate in a successful full-scale efficacy study through an R01 grant application. So just coming full circle to the, the couple-based approach and what are some of the benefits and challenges of it? So. The benefits are that you obtain two perspectives on an issue. And I think this is really important when you're dealing with sensitive issues. And so we're asking the drinkers for their alcohol use to self-report, but also their, their partner. And so we'll have their partner's data to kind of corroborate the drinker's self-report. Um, another benefit is to treat the couple as a, as a unit. And so we're ultimately trying to improve, you know, reduce alcohol use, but the wives are also going to benefit from this intervention through reduced violence, through reduced food insecurity and other um, benefits. 
I think couple-based approaches are really great for communally-based societies, such as in Sub-Saharan Africa, where people are living in, in ext with extended family and relatives around and used to making decisions in a collaborative way. They just may not have the skills to do so or to communicate. And then it allows both partners to be involved and to foster support within the couple. So even if we're intervening on the drinker, the, the partner can still benefit and they can support each other. The challenges are, of course, you know, you're recruiting two people at once, and as, as opposed to just one individual, you're doing, dealing with two people's schedules and two people's consent, and so it's more complex. Um, there could be the potential for power dynamics within the couple. Um, so one partner could co potentially coerce the other to participate. We have this all. We have controls in place during our consent process to look for this and to make sure that people come freely to um, the study. And then of course, breakups could be a challenge. Um, there's high divorce rates in this setting. Thankfully, we, we haven't had any couples break up yet. And then of course, the additional cost of re recruiting two people as compared to one. Um, an additional question, I guess, is that I've been asked with couple-based approaches is, you know, is this sustainable? Is this something that we can implement in a really busy clinical setting because it's hard enough to get patients to travel great distances to the clinic. It, is it possible to get both of them to come to the clinic on a regular basis? So um, I, I think the jury is still out on, on, on that. So just to wrap up, um, primary partners are filling key gaps in the healthcare system in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially in Malawi. They are acting as nurses, peer navigators, social workers, counselors. They're doing a lot of the work that, um, that could normally be done in, in, you know, in a different type of healthcare system. So we're really, we're, we're essentially bolstering the healthcare, healthcare system at the local level. Um, there's a need for strengthening couples and families from the ground up. So the idea is that we, we want to improve the lives of people living with HIV, but if we can strengthen the couples, then this will have implications for a wide range of, of health issues, not just alcohol or HIV. Um, and so this is a picture of the Malambe tree in Malawi with my daughter when she was really young. And the Malambe tree is a, they're hundreds of years old. They provide a source of shelter for the villages and a meeting place. And then if they're healthy, they bear fruit that people can make um, jam out of and, and make an income out of. So the idea is really to keep these trees um, healthy and long lasting and a sustainable source of life for these families. So I just want to acknowledge all my wonderful co-investigators, collaborators and staff, including um, Dr. Fred who couldn't be here today and I, it's such a pleasure to work with Dr. Fred because I've always wanted to intervene on economic level and came across his work. And it's just, it's so inspiring to be able to have this opportunity to um, really try to break the cycle of poverty in these families. Um, of course, our, our staff, both at UCSF and at the Invest in Knowledge Initiative in Malawi, this would not be possible without the amazing staff that we have in place that are you know, making sure things are running smoothly. This is a very complicated intervention. So our staff have just done such an amazing job. Um, of course, I'd like to thank our funders, the staff in Malawi, as well as our research participants. And Zikomo Kwambiri, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Conroy. Um, I might have frozen for a second. I just wanted to note and encourage everyone to engage. There, there we, we do have a question in the chat Are you and a couple announcements. Are you able to access that or would you like me to read it, Dr. Conroy? Sure, do you wanna read? Just sure, to absolutely. It it's, it's just scrolling, sorry, here we go. Um, this is from Peter. I would like to know what will actually motivate the men to stop drinking with the existence of stress and or mental health issues around them that actually push them to drink more. This strategy can surely work more, especially in the rural areas. Yeah, I mean, the, the, 
the poverty and feelings of hopelessness is really um, one of the main, and, and boredom from, from not working is one of the main drivers of um, alcohol use and challenges of being able to, to stop drinking. And so I, I'm really excited about this approach because it addresses those very issues by giving men something to do in the forms of an, a business or you know, raising livestock or something that, that keeps them away from, from drinking. Um, out of boredom and hopelessness and in poor mental health. So um, we'll see, that's the ultimate goal. I, I'm excited about what we've found thus far. And I, I hope that, um, that that theory holds true in our findings, so. Great, and I have some questions that have come through um, back channels. So um, to follow up on that, um, is, is drinking alcohol a common element like in the greater um, community or is it more specific to this population, um, to this group that you're, that you're studying? And um, are there other good alternatives other, uh, of activities that could be incentivized and encouraged? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mostly study people living with HIV, but um, I, I, so I can't speak to the prevalence of drinking in the general population, but I would imagine it, it's it's also high in, in other groups that are, are not living with HIV um, and in other places in Sub-Saharan Africa, especially South Africa, where we have another um, study with couples on alcohol use, the levels of alcohol use are among the highest in the world in the general population. So I would assume a similar um, trend is, is in Malawi as well. Um, and can you remind me the second part of that question? It was kind of more of a comment saying um, that, I scrolled away from it, <laughs> that this would be a particularly um, a, a good strategy in rural areas. Yeah, so most of Malawi is rural. <laughs> so um, it has the potential to have a large impact population Why? Um, few people live in cities. There's only a handful of cities, and even within the cities, they're peri-urban um, areas. And so, um, I think, I think this is, yeah, I think this is a great approach. And our our rural couples are coming to the sessions. They're very interested, and they're they're very interested in the financial literacy piece as well. It's people have changed their their plans because of our study and. You know, they were going to go to a funeral or to a wedding and they they changed their plans specifically so they could attend the financial literacy sessions. Um, so this is very new to folks. They People don't have the skills even to develop a, a very simple budget. And so, um, yeah, I think the potential in the rural areas is really high impact. Great. Thanks. We have some more questions coming in um, from William. It says, thank you, Dr. Conroy. Uh, great work. How do you avoid unintentional disclosure among couples? So that's a great question. So to be eligible for the study, they actually have to have disclosed their HIV status to their partner. Um, and so we we don't enroll them if they if they haven't told their partner. Um, and these are also married couples. So they, they've been together for quite a bit of time and they know each other really well. Um, and so I, I don't think that we've excluded many who haven't disclosed yet. Um, and I, I also think, you know, things have changed in a lot in the past 10 years around HIV stigma and disclosure. And at least I can speak to Malawi. I feel like people are more comfortable now with, with, with HIV. Of course, it's still very private but um, we've come a long way in the past 10 years. Um, and so these couples, they've all disclosed to each other. Yeah. Great, thanks. And the next question is, uh, thank you for this presentation. This is from uh, Francis or Gregson. Um, thank you for this presentation and for the work you are doing. Do you think that the methodology for this study can be utilized in certain settings in the United States? Yeah, it's a really great question. Um, most of my work is in Sub-Saharan Africa, so I can't speak 
too much to the United States, but I would imagine it's similar issues around poverty. I mean, those, those types of themes probably hold true in the United States as well. Um, and you would, I think you would have to, yeah, the, the microfinance or the, the savings-based culture, I think there's the potential for economic interventions in the, in the US, but um, it, could, it would have to be a different type of economic um, intervention to be relevant, I think. Great, and um, if someone can type quickly, I think we have time for one more question, and I do have some um, that have come um, that haven't been posted, but I just want to give our participating audience one last chance um, before we have to wrap it up. Okay, I'll um, let's see here. Oh, I we have a good question um, about the those really strong retention rates in your in the second study. Um, do you know what it attribute is can be that can be attributed to? Yeah, so again, I, our staff are doing such an amazing job. Um, our facilitators are in constant contact with our participants. So they're calling them to see how are they doing with the banking? Are they able to make deposits? Um, they're going to their villages to track them if they can't reach them. They have gotten to know the participants very well um, and, th and just through repeated contact. And so I think that's one of the reasons why our retention rates are, are so high. And I also think that, you know, Dr. Fred's work has been highly successful in Uganda and high retention rates. And so I think this is a model that, that works. It's been shown to work in other places. And I think we're just seeing that also start to work in Malawi and people are very interested in financial literacy and improving their, their families. They just don't have the skills or training or resources to do so. So it's a major unfilled gap. And I think people are really excited for that um, opportunity. So for those reasons, I would say. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna throw it to my colleague, um, our co-director, Dr. Prescovia Nabunya, to um, kind of close us out today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. And thank you so much, Dr. Amy, for that excellent presentation. Uh, to many of us, it speaks to our work. Um, we, we see, uh, we usually think about how do we uh, implement such interventions among, you know, within uh, as, uh, different settings, but this actually speaks to that economic empowerment strengthening components. We, you know, we've been imp we've been implementing among youth and children, and now, you know, here we are um, implementing them among couples uh, for for um, to address issues around uh, uh, drinking. So thank you so much for those. Um, so thank you everybody who has joined us. Um, uh, I want to. To, to indicate to remind us, we have our two uh, we have our boom launch uh, next week uh, on February 16th from 10 to 11 a.m. Please join us, uh, and also the speaker for our next month uh, will be uh, Professor Juliet Sekandi, assistant professor uh, from the University of Georgia, who will be talking to us about harnessing the power of digital technology to support and improve treatment outcomes in patients with tuberculosis and this work is also um, being done in Uganda. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Amy, please send thank our Thank you so much for having me. All right, thank you, bye.